Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear fellows, uh, this is an honor for me <coughs> to welcome you to the 82nd uh, Simon Wiesenthal lecture. It's amazing, 82nd. <laughs> so, my name is Eva Kovac, and I'm the deputy director of Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. And it's also a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our speaker, Lea David. Lea is an assistant professor at the School of Sociology at the University College uh, Dublin. Uh, Lea finished her PhD at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Ben Gurion University in Israel. And her dissertation explores, explores how a contested past is managed through clashes between local and global memory cultures. Her research interests cover memory, nationalism, human rights, the intersection between the Holocaust and genocide, and conflicts in the former Yugoslav countries and in Israel and Palestine. Previously, uh, um, <clears throat> Lea held several postdoctoral fellowships, including the Fulbright and the Mercury. She has published in English, Hebrew, and Serbo-Croatian. Her book, The Past Can't Heal, <clears throat> uh, Can't Heal Us, The Dangers of Mandating Memory in the Name of Human Rights, was published in 2020 with uh, Cambridge University Press and was awarded the honorable mention uh, for the 2021 ESA Sociology of Human Rights Gordon Hirabayashi Award. In this innovative, sometimes provocative study, Lea investigated the relationship between human rights and memory. She suggest, suggested that human rights should be treated as an ideology. Her concept gives us useful theoretical and methodological tools to recognize the real impact human rights has on the ground. In the age moral remembrance, the agenda of human rights became implemented. Uh, Lea argues in this book that this uh, memorialization agenda didn't lead to a better ap appreciation of human rights. On the contrary, it strengthens national sentiments, divisions, and uh, uh, along ethnic lines and lead to the new forms of societal inequalities. So it's really a very provoking uh, hypothesis. Uh, but tonight, she will tell us about a different but equally interesting topic, namely about the desire objects, which means personal items of the missing or killed uh, found at the site of mass atrocities are often understood as the last tangible link with the absent person. And I really uh, want to thank you, Lea, that you, you gave us a, a brand new uh, research result. And as you mentioned to me <clears throat> earlier, we are your first audience to discuss it. So let's see what will happen and welcome. The floor uh, is yours. Thank you. Maybe you should wait to thank me after the lecture <laughs> and then you decide. <laughs> You know, we should we can go both ways. So I'll I'll stand here. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'm so grateful for this invitation, and especially today. Today is the uh, Holocaust uh, uh, Remembrance Day in Israel, so somehow it it uh, fits, and you will see this topic also. Well, the whole institute, so it it, it has to fit in some way. Uh, as you can see, uh, my presentation is called uh, A Shoe, a Broken Watch and Marbles, How Objects Shape Our Memory and Our Future. So this is completely novel, and uh, as Eva said, uh, this is my first time to present it, so fingers crossed, uh, and I hope you are going to enjoy it, and I hope that you are going to have, that we are going to have some conversation. I really want to learn from you because uh, I'm a sociologist, I'm not historian, I'm, I'm you know, dealing uh, with the Holocaust and genocide only from the side of uh, uh, memory studies, uh, human rights, nationalism, so, uh, and here I'm stepping out from my comfort zone. 
So what is it all about? To start this lecture, actually, I need to go uh, one step back. And I need to go back to this uh, book that uh, Eva actually mentioned, The Past Can Heal Us, The Dangers of Mandating Memory in the Name of Human Rights. Uh, because I, I want to maybe say two things uh, about it uh, just as uh, intro to this uh, lecture. It was uh, actually conceptualized in a such a way to understand how at the global level we have something completely new, which is this uh, new uh, human rights memorization agenda. So what is this human rights memorization agenda? Uh, I was tracing it in a way sociologically and historically to see this emergence of this new pattern of how we actually remember uh, past uh, atrocities around the globe. So we see there are three different uh, uh, features uh, of this, uh, what I called moral remembrance, facing the past, duty to remember, and victim-centered approach. Each of those concepts actually uh, have its own sociological, historical trajectories, but somehow over the years uh, they overlapped and they, become, they became a bedrock of what we know today as a proper memorization. You know, you have somewhere atrocity, so this is the way you need to do it. It is very much prescribed. It is kind of, uh, there is only one way, one correct way to actually remember uh, past atrocities. And I was thinking uh, along the way, actually, so, if we have this notion of moral remembrance, if we have this agenda of the human rights, um, like human rights memorization agenda, what happens, and again, it was uh, in a way constructed at the world polity level, and only that, mostly through different peace agreements, entered uh, different nation states. What happens on the ground? What happens with the people? How they react to that when th this agenda comes you know, you have endless NGO programs, uh, you have uh, dialogue groups, uh, you have uh, peace and um, uh, reconciliation. There's so many, so many different programs. They all embody this logic of moral remembrance or some parts of it, of facing the past duty to remember a victim-centered approach. And I was wondering, do actually those people on the ground, you know, become more um, uh, appreciative of human rights after that? And as, as Eva said, my conclusions were, and still are, very dark, that uh, actually uh, we see completely different thing that is happening. So, uh, I wanted to say, uh, to give this short intro uh, just uh, for two reasons. Uh, so, book came out, uh, I had uh, many different reviews, but there was something in those reviews that kept coming back. And people were saying, well, maybe this is true, but there's so much more to how people actually react and, and accept uh, this agenda. It, you made it very narrow. So I felt like, okay, I should take this seriously and I should understand it actually differently. So this is one reason why I actually I wanted to do the second research. Uh, I wanted to take now completely the opposite approach, not to go from top down, but to go bottom up. But okay, you know now that there is like tons of research about how different groups, NGOs, uh, uh, educational projects uh, affect uh, actually remembrance and human rights and in post-conflict settings. So there is a vast literature actually about how different uh, people understand uh, uh, those processes. And I wanted to do something completely different. So I did something completely different. So be prepared for something completely different, like in Monty Python. So I said, wait, I want to see actually what is happening in this uh, human object uh, relationship. What can we understand from objects, how they move through different spheres, uh, social spheres, and what changes? So let's start, objects. You know, they're all around us. We, we buy them, we build them, we sell them, we repair them, we break them, uh, we, we give them away, uh, you know, we replace them. 
every single thing you can imagine, we do with objects. Actually, everything around us is made out of objects. So when I talk about objects, I'm talking about very narrow category of objects that I called desire objects. Well, now you need to bear with me why desire objects. Uh, desire objects are present during a death that is not regarded as part of a natural cycle of a life because the event must involve responsible party, an intention, a violent act, a deep feeling that an injustice has been done. So what am I trying to say here? I'm actually including here only objects that are found in the places of mass atrocities. So, uh, because you can say, okay, what about car accidents? No, so that's why I made this very clear what can be included here and why those, you know, this lecture will try to uh, actually claim why this specific uh, type of or category of objects has a potential to make an impact actually in our uh, understanding of not only past, but also the future. So desire objects are found, that are found are scarce. Of course, if you find something in a, a mass grave, it is obviously scarce. Uh, and their survival actually ignites uh, uh, an instant link between the killed and the act of killing, meaning for those who understand it, the, once you have a wallet that is found in a, in a mass grave, you will understand that that belonged to a person who was killed. So it, immediately you have this uh, link. Desire objects provide a direct link to the crime scene where the atrocity is still part of a living memory whereby those immediately affected are themselves direct carriers of the memory of an event. We'll get to it. So well, now just to uh, explain why I call them desire objects, because there, there is nothing, it is not something that you actually want to buy, so that's like you desire to have them. No, on the contrary, desire objects, because those objects actually represent the desires and hopes of people who get those objects uh, desire to get justice, uh, desire to um, prolong the death, the, the life of the person who died. So there is much investment in those objects as what they represent and how we would like to see future, you know, happening. So that's why the desire objects. Although you will see, you can also say that it is very, very dark, but we will get to it. Now, Thanks to my uh, lovely uh, daughter who drew this, I can explain you briefly what actually, what are those cycles through which desire objects are going through. So just imagine, uh, hypothetically, you have, uh, you know, some mass atrocity taking place. We can imagine many different uh, atrocities taking place even as I speak. Someone, you know, gets uh, executed. Time passes by, at the same uh, place we have a family coming there to have a picnic and suddenly someone finds this lovely watch. Okay, the watch that, was, that belonged to a person who got executed there. After that we see that this watch comes back to the family of the deceased. Okay, and then it, became, it becomes appreciated and you know it becomes like a... a I think you cannot see it because of this, the whole uh, image there, but the, um, the, the watch is uh, there on the wall. So it has a completely, you know, very important place because that is the only thing that actually uh, is, is left from a person who got killed. And then we have this situation where this watch is being donated and becomes a, a display in a museum. So we have completely different setting. We will talk what is happening in each of those uh, cycles. But then again, uh, we can see in some cases how this becomes in transcendence, actually the, the physicality, materiality of the watch itself, and it becomes part of uh, political action, some kind of a protest, demonstration with particular moral claims. And at the end of the day, 
in some rare situations, we can see how actually those cycles lead to particular action by the end of the day. And I will go into to, to narrow down with each cycle, we see actually different things are happening and why some objects still have potential to get to this uh, part and why others are going to be um, left alone in this uh, um, uh, transition. So now if you're coming from um, archaeology, anthropology, museology, you know to deal with uh, objects. Uh, but what is uh, currently the state of um, uh, literature about the object human relations? We always take objects at the point when they're found as if that is the, their last stop. What I want to see and what I want to show that biographies of, of those objects continue. And actually, I want to tell you what, are the, what is the future of those objects. So not just to stop it, you know, with this material object as is, but to see how they develop and sometimes become actually symbols. Now, what am I going to check here in each of those uh, cycles is actually emotional energy and value because what is changing is the emotional energy that people actually invest once they uh, encounter this object and also uh, what changes is their value. Well, it, will, it will become more clear as I speak. So this is our first uh, cycle, and they call it in the limbo. This is actually the moment in which those uh, uh, desire objects uh, are discovered. Sometimes they're discovered, you know, by chance, uh, and sometimes they're discovered uh, with intention because you know there is a mass grave there, so you go and dig and this is how you find, or it, it can be concentration camp, it can be factory, it can be many other places in which actually atrocities uh, happen. So I'm not uh, limiting this concept only to current moment, but actually we can take it and I'm going to take it back to the Holocaust. And in a poetic way, we can understand that those desire objects appear from the depth of dead pits, muddy forests, idyllic hills, murky rivers, abandoned prisons, schools, churches, factories, shelters, from both unexpected and remarkably central places, carrying secrets of torture, agony, suffering, execution, and death. Most often, they, they vanish and sink together with their owners into an irreversible and definite decay and demise. But sometimes, just every so often, like precious hidden gems, they survive. They appear suddenly, they get discovered and kept. So you can understand that most of those objects actually disappear, vast majority. And here what, you, what we have in this picture is actually the hand of uh, uh, a person called uh, Ramiz Nukic, and he, is, uh, he dedicated his life in the past uh, 20 years or so to go around uh, hills and forests of Srebrenica and to search actually objects and bones of those uh, who killed uh, during the genocide. So he actually found many, 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 many objects and uh, much more bones. So this is, again, it can happen as an intention, but it can also happen uh, just as. Now, we are moving from this limbo to this second uh, cycle. Once we have those objects, what happens with them? Okay, you know, they are, they are being treated as objects that were found on uh, places of mass atrocity. So the first, first uh, uh, station, so to say, is to different storage places and uh, uh, in for forensic uh, uh, facilities. So uh, it is interesting to see that already at this stage, many of those objects will never go and find uh, their uh, owner's home. They will not be returned back. Uh, many things can happen. For example, we have this uh, terrible example, I would say, in 2005 and 2006, that 1,000 of those, uh, uh, what I call desire objects, actually uh, personal items of uh, victims of uh, uh, Srebrenica uh, massacre, 
were completely destroyed uh, by the uh, ICTY, uh, International Criminal uh, Tribunal for Yugoslavia, because they didn't, didn't need them. Okay, they finished that uh, case, so they just, you know, uh, burned them. And they said it goes with our protocol. It is a, a safety hazard. We had to do it. Of course, there was a, a suit after against them uh, on behalf of the relatives of, the, of those people who, who's uh, um, this object belong to. So you can see things can, you know, uh, disappear completely or they can be destroyed. Um, but also they can be used as, um, like as an evidence in a court uh, with the forensic um, uh, purposes to discover actually who are those people who were killed. So this is, for example, in a, a Lazete mass grave in Bosnia, four watches that were found, uh, and they show uh, those watches are stopped at various times uh, in July 15, for example, uh, 1995, and uh, th this indicates that owners all died around the same time. So you can actually use them as an evidence of this vi uh, violent death. <clears throat> also, we see how those belongings are often collected in an effort actually to trace uh, uh, relatives or to identify. So their first purpose is actually to help identification of those uh, who died. So we see, for example, in Bosnia, we see this book of belongings uh, uh, that was published. I mean, they actually took all those uh, uh, objects, personal items that were found in mass graves, and they tried to reach out to people who lost their, um, you know, family members to recognize actually uh, some of those objects uh, to help this process of identification. So we see also in uh, Republika Srpska, in Kosovo, we see those projects also elsewhere in the world. Uh, for example, this was also use, used uh, for Maya. Uh, in Guatemala, uh, the same type of um, uh, projects. So what can we say actually about this second uh, cycle? So what is the value of those objects? First of all, the value is uh, like forensic and uh, evidentiary, you know, this is what they use at the, uh, this stage. Uh, we see, for example, how does it look like uh, here in Podrin Identification Project uh, <clears throat> that, you know, they have bags with, with all kinds of things, and this is very important to collect them just for the sake, again, their value is to identify others. Okay, so far I didn't talk much about emotional energy, because actually people who are involved, you know, they're mostly professionals, those objects are passing, you know, one hand to another, one storage to another, and there it is, uh, of course, emotional project, but it, there is nothing... Uh, personal about it. But what happens in the next cycle is actually when those objects, those lucky ones, come back to private homes of the people actually who, uh, who died, who, killed, who got killed. So here we see um, Fazila Efendic, uh, a husband who was shot dead at the age of uh, 46 in the forest by Bosnian troops, uh, Bosnian Serb troops. She uh, keeps her husband Hamid's old terracotta collar shirt in the closet. When I miss him, I open the closet, I touch the shirt, and I can say it, I feel better or worse than, she says, but uh, I must touch it. There is, uh, for this emotional energy, there is a really instant uh, um, uh, importance of smell, of touch. I carry it around it wherever I go says someone else, uh, while her uh, carefully uh, carrying a tobacco box. She keeps the items in several plastic bags. They are still as dirty as they were found when, f when her f husband was found, Himzo. He was uh, uh, excavated uh, from a mass grave. But for her, those objects carry an emotional burden too heavy to face. She rarely looks at the object uh, as each time she takes them out, she instantly remembers the words too painful to process, the words forensic experts told her when they handed those objects to her. 
Hamza, after being shot, may still have been alive when buried. So this is where the uh, actually uh, real life of those uh, desire objects starts with this encounter uh, with the family or the owner, owners of, uh, of those objects. Imagine now a woman uh, gets back this watch that belonged to her uh, husband, father, it doesn't matter. She doesn't need a story. She can look at it and she will see her past life uh, uh, together. She knows instantly actually to reflect all those memories uh, upon that uh, object. Okay, and of course, the, the emotional energy at this stage is, there is nothing more precious for those people than those objects. But what happens here with the value of the object? Value is extremely uh, high, but only for those people who are actually involved in this uh, uh, thing. If you put it outside, no one will react. So they don't have value apart from the family of the deceased. And we see, again, uh, Husu Halilovic, a Bosnian survivor, recognized the remains of uh, his father, Bayro, in a mass grave. Uh, he found his watch and a comb. When I see these items, I'm flooded with tears. I remember uh, how this watch was always in his, on his hand and he was combing his hair every morning. These are only mementos I have. So you understand how precious uh, those uh, things are. Here we have another uh, story about this personal value. In the mass grave at Kozluk, they found the remains of uh, Sadmir uh, Nukic's grandfather, Asim, and the pocket watch that was uh, important to both of them. It was the uh, watch his grandfather promised to give him when he finished reading the Quran. So again, there are stories those uh, um, desire objects bring, but they don't need to be uh, told because for them, they're immediate, uh, uh, there is immediate uh, association. So now we see that actually what happens in many cases, those objects are being donated. They are being moved away. So we see some uh, reasoning why is that happening. Uh, again, uh, Ahmed Hrustanovic, a genocide survivor, in his struggle to keep uh, the memory of his killed father, reflects on the fragility. Uh, sometimes a man, in these fears and emotions, asks himself, did I really have a father? Can you imagine that you have even that kind of a thought? But then, uh, when I see a letter, when I see a photo, I feel relieved. I decided to donate those letters and some of those photos to a museum. Then we see, for example, um, Amra, who lost uh, her father. I donated my father's uh, last letter, wristwatch and glasses that he sent us via Red Cross uh, vehicles. We see here another testimony that is... Um, Yes, uh, uh, very uh, hard to actually uh, to read. I was thinking of giving those cards, the letter and the pictures because I can never look at these. I try to take them, then I put them back. I can't look at them. I was thinking of giving them to the museum because after I die, there is nobody to care for them. When we die, maybe everything will be thrown away. Why I give uh, different uh, stories? First of all, to see how emotional energy is here important and how difficult uh, those uh, actually uh, objects are. Sometimes people really cherish them and put them, you know, in a central places, uh, in a cabinets, uh, in their, their uh, um, houses. But sometimes, you know, they, they just cannot look at them. Uh, so there are many different reasons why actually people uh, want to donate it. They want to make sense out of it. They want to do something. They don't know what to do, how to make sense. Again, desire objects because they project into it all kinds of ideas and desires, uh, how, you know, the, to give a meaning for, for a unjust uh, death. And finally, uh, Donations, uh, again, uh, the Meva Hodjic holding a bag uh, with a tobacco box. 
a rusted Swiss, uh, uh, Swiss uh, knife and a key, uh, all of which are uh, covered with the crumbs of clay. So it belongs to uh, it belongs to these items, and they should stay together. I was asked to give it all uh, for a museum because those uh, items were found in a mass grave. But no, she said, "How can I do that if this that is the only thing I have left from him?" So you see that not everyone is actually. Uh, willing to to um, donate, and often it has to do with uh, you know psychological processes and different uh, periods of grieving. But yes, not everyone wants actually to to uh, be apart from it. But now we need to actually move to understand what happens once those objects become donated, because now they're completely displaced from the so to say natural setting in which uh, you know uh, people can recognize them di directly they can understand what is the meaning of those objects so again if we talk about museums we are talking about uh, uh, grand uh, institutions of manipulations if you want to uh, call it that way because everything there is in a museum is always actually uh, made in such a way to um, pump this possible emotion and energy that will people have once they meet, they have an encounter with a certain object. So, of course, when you m walk through a museum, you will have different objects, but they're sequenced in a certain way to lead you through this uh, story. But now it is not also enough just to place uh, one object. You need to, because it says nothing to us. We don't have anything relational. You, we can have some blurred idea about this place, about this museum, whether it is about Holocaust or it is about some genocide. It doesn't matter. So we have some idea, but we don't have anything emotional. We don't have this attachment with this object. So it is interesting what is actually happening in a museum. Generally speaking, when we go to a museum, we're actually pushed to, de to do this, um, uh, what is uh, understood as emotional labor. You know, emotional labor that we go and we actually frame ourselves to be in a certain uh, mood and to react in a certain way, to censor actually our emotional state, but to work hard, you know, to, to have this emotional involvement. So you go from one place, you see, you try to read, and then there is a specific uh, light coming from here. And if you want to actually um, expand this emotional energy, we'll put also a photo. It is not enough to have this watch. You need to have a text. You need to have some oral testimony. You saw there are all kinds of ways just to bring us into this context. We, as people who are coming to museums, are supposed to, you know, go to work hard uh, emotionally and to understand this context to be elevated from here and now to this, uh, some other place. And while we are doing it, you know, uh, there is something about collective emotional energy. We are going together. We have a maybe different pace of things, but still we are going to um, censor uh, our, uh, make kind of censorship of our uh, emotional behavior to adjust it to others. So we are not going to, I don't know, eat sandwich there. We are not going to laugh. We are not going to spit. We are not going to sing. So, you know, there is kind of like you're going to a library. So you have a set of uh, things that you, it's not even that someone told you to do that. You actually, uh, as part of this emotional labor, you start being in that mode. So in that sense, I mean, I can talk much more about museums, but I want to move a bit uh, more. Here again, it is one of the classical, but you, any museum, especially if it has to do with Holocaust or any genocide, you will see actually those what we call artifacts or personal items. So this one is an exhibition from um, Once Upon a Time and Never Again. Sorry. Um, about the Kosovo War, and here, I don't know if you can, you can see it good, this is the story about those marbles, uh, about this um, seven-year-old um, boy, uh, Abri, that was uh, killed uh, 
together with his um, uh, whole family in, uh, during the, by the Serbian troops in the Kosovo War. And several months after that, his father, who actually survived because he was not there, went to this um, place uh, where um, his whole family was executed, and he found those marbles on the ground. And they, those marbles were the marbles that his father gave it to him. And when he got to testify, he was like holding those marbles and saying, this is what I have. This is the only thing. You know, it was very emotional. So I thought um, this says enough about um, uh, the, the personal items. Now I'm going to do very uh, huge cut and I'm going to narrow it down and I will explain throughout the um, other slides why I think this uh, item has the most bigger potential to, to become a symbol out of all the personal items you can imagine. And we are talking about victim shoes. So of course, when you see this, there is no need to tell you what is it about. You see it and you recognize it. So actually, what we are talking here, we are talking about this fifth cycle. And this has to do about circulation and vernacularization of those items. Meaning, how we actually acquired knowledge, prior knowledge about those uh, objects. So uh, I did a historical analysis about uh, those victim shoes. So we know that it started uh, even already during the Second World War. Uh, there were drawings, uh, and there were, of course, uh, testimonials, uh, 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 things like that, but everything was at that point, uh, we can talk about something that is very fragmented. Only in the years to come, we have again, uh, and those who are dealing with the, with the Holocaust uh, um, will know much more than, than myself, but we have those preparations uh, from the, for the massacre, and this is one of those uh, drawings. Uh, um, it was done in, uh, already in 43. Then we have uh, actually those photos, you know, the moment uh, those um, uh, concentration camps uh, were um, liberated, uh, we have a huge amount of, of uh, people coming and taking photos. Those photos were used uh, in the Nuremberg trials, in many trials after that, uh, of course. Then we have, you know, uh, artistical images of this pile of shoes. And then as we pro uh, proceed, you know, with years to come, from the Auschwitz uh, State Museum that was established in 46, and then Nuremberg <clears throat> trials in 47, uh, uh, the Ghetto Fighters Museum in Israel in 49, Yad Vashem Museum 53, Eichmann trial, that was also very important because it was televised <coughs> in the 60s, the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt, um, and the list goes on and on and on. Of course, uh, there is this, um, in the 70s, uh, TV uh, broadcast the uh, Holocaust in the United States. We have this the whole process of Americanization of the Holocaust. And of course, <coughs> uh, the establishment of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, uh, and um, Leitzman's, uh, Latzman's uh, movie Shoah. This is, of course, brief. We have much, much, much more examples. But the uh, amount of doc documentaries, photo exhibitions, artistic uh, works, literature, movies, commemorations, um, establishments uh, of the Holocaust Museum, survivor testimonials, oral history projects, history textbooks, they actually gave us those visuals uh, in a, such a way that uh, they are recognizable beyond any doubt. And I uh, actually made uh, a test. If you want to know why this object differs from any other object, try to imagine this victim shoe. Um, ah, no, wait. I'll show you. Uh, wait. A uh, victim shoe that is on a, without any context, without any uh, narration, you will immediately know. 
you know, you will understand that we are talking about that is a clear reference. Do it, you know, you can actually uh, Google it, just write victim shoe, you will see an image, you will understand completely. But in, uh, if you put uh, <coughs> any other object, wallet, uh, um, I don't know, watch, anything else, you need to have context because it can be this, but it can be also car crash, it can be a million other things. It is not so uh, intuitive actually to understand that this is something that, that is connected to very um, a specific uh, thing. And it is interesting because victim shoe is both specific, but it is also very general. And here we see, for example, first picture is from this um, uh, exhibition about Kosovo. Second two pictures are from the exhibition that is currently taking place in the Srebrenica Memorial uh, Center. Then, uh, third and fourth, can you imagine, can you, what, can you guess? This is from 9-11, uh, and this is uh, from Rwanda. So it doesn't matter, you know, because there is a reference to this victim shoe. But to understand why actually shoes are different from any other object, we need to understand them also as a broader category. What is shoe actually in our life? Because only once you understand that you go to a museum or you see this picture anywhere, you come with pre-knowledge not only about circulation of those images of victim shoe, but also with the knowledge of what shoe is actually in your life. And shoe, we can connect to endless things, you know, uh, from uh, traveling, hiking, jumping, dancing, gender, ethnicity, uh, sex. Uh, there are so many different references to shoes in our life. And what happens when you meet in uh, spaces like museums, actually a victim shoe or the pile of shoes, you immediately have this uh, confl conflicting uh, understanding of, on the one hand, something that is so mundane, you know, we buy shoes, we sell shoes, we, 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 we uh, give it away, you know, it is, it is shoes are mostly non-issue, but they're always connected with life, with something we do, that is, you know, it is about comfort. It is, it is always connected with life. And on the other hand, we see those shoes, victim shoes that are like all about death, loss and destruction. And it's, this contrast actually uh, provokes in us very, very strong uh, uh, emotional reaction. This is how uh, actually our mutual emotional reaction uh, comes at its peak because we have those contracts, contra contrasting, yeah, contrasting uh, images. Whereas when we see other objects, this is not happening. Uh, if we talk about watch, it is always limited to a perception of time. If we talk about glasses, uh, you know, some people wear glasses, some don't. Again, it is very restricted to their function. But shoes are so much more because they have so many different functions. And of course, there is also uh, architecture of a shoe. You have a shoe, but something is missing. So it is always about absence and presence. And now I'm going to uh, bring this, uh, yeah, to, uh, um, to try to show you actually why this matters and how actually the life of those objects uh, does not stop in those museums, but actually they have a potential to do, to, uh, to force us to actually communicate our vision about future and uh, inspire us for actually public uh, political action. So sixth cycle is actually political action. I guess you recognize this. This is uh, from Budapest uh, and uh, uh, shoes on a Danube promenade. promenade. And this is uh, just recently where um, people were passing by and were bringing shoes as 
uh, an act of solidarity with Ukrainians. <clears throat> so, just one second. <laughs> The Holocaust Memorial on the bank of the Danube has several pair of bronze shoes because the Jewish people who were marched here had to take their shoes off before they were shot into the Danube. As you can see, Budapest has plenty of secrets and stories in store for everyone. Check out the rest of the videos for these stories. Okay. This it looks very similar, yeah? But this is actually activists put shoes outside uh, Georgia's uh, parliament to remember children who died in Ukrainian war. Okay, so we see already a pattern, but what about here? So now we see actually how those uh, uh, desire objects uh, moved uh, from, you know, being evidence, uh, uh, the, having um, a forensic value to becoming, to having a personal value, then having educational value, and now they're starting to have a symbolic value. And now you can see, uh, I mean, I was really surprised. I didn't expect uh, to find this. I was expe I expected to find everything that has to do in relation to different mass atrocities, how, how we can actually see the potential, especially of this uh, victim shoe. But actually, if you start from the beginning, this is uh, Mexico 2016, shoes put there uh, for the victims of the cartel, you know, cartel victims. Second here is uh, Serbian activists actually honor uh, Srebrenica victims uh, with shoes. Then we have again demonstrations in Belgrade uh, for Ukraine, and we see again this motif of shoes. You know, and then this one here is um, uh, an action that was uh, uh, taking, uh, that, that they were taking 7,000 pairs of shoes, uh, putting them in front of the capital to represent children killed by gun violence. Okay, so we are seeing actually the scope of this political action is being broadened. Now, the, there we see shoes, uh, again, and notes uh, left uh, outside um, uh, public school buildings in protest to state vaccine mandate. So again, completely new context. Then we have here, next one, Israeli protest uh, against uh, violence, um, protest violence against uh, um, Israeli protest against uh, violence against women, okay? Then we have here, this is a huge one. This is like Paris climate uh, uh, protesters. And we actually see all around the world images like those, you know, for climate action. And then here we see again something completely different. This is um, in um, a creation protest for better jobs. So you see how again this political action expands. This next one here, uh, 40,000 pairs of shoes symbolizing Americans killed by guns in only one year. And here, uh, to commemorate victims of the 1995 Srebrenica massacre, we have shoes in front of the, uh, in the main square of Ankara. So we see vast um, array of political action. <clears throat> Again, first one is the Australian Road Safety Foundation, uh, road safety campaign <coughs> for those who died in, in um, road accidents in Australia. Then this is the uh, protest called uh, Eyes Wide Open, the human cost of war in Iraq. So this is uh, 800 uh, sets of uh, combat boots actually bearing the name of uh, US soldiers that were killed actually in Iraq. Then we have, uh, this one is also interesting. This is 1,558 pairs of shoes 
in San Francisco of people who kill themselves jumping from uh, the Golden Bridge uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, and then we have uh, again um, uh, many others we have also pairs for uh, uh, women's shoes uh, uh, in Istanbul against uh, uh, violence uh, but we can also have um, this one is um, 440 pairs of uh, women's shoes uh, were hanged on the city. Sorry, this is a vigil for our colleagues who died from coronavirus recently in Washington. So this is commemoration actually of a nurse who actually died out of coronavirus. And this one, you know, uh, the March of the Living. So it is again the same concept uh, that this is in Budapest, but we have it in many different places around the globe. And also, we see it here, uh, you know, Palestinian life matters, but we have Ukrainian life matters, black life matters. So again, the whole concept of shoes as something that inspires political action. And, okay, I'm coming to, um, to this end of this presentation. As I started at the beginning, in my first book, I wanted to understand how actually this top-down understanding of memorialization uh, human rights memorialization agenda affects uh, people on the ground, especially if they become more uh, prone to human rights. So I go here the other way around from uh, bottom up and I climb and I climb and I want to see actually if we can understand those actions, those political actions or how they relate to uh, human rights and what is this power of the, <clears throat> of the symbol. So on the one hand, yes, uh, first of all, we need to understand that those shoes became symbols and they created vocabulary that is completely understandable here and anywhere else. So, you know, we did talk about social media, but that is nothing in comparison to this. You know, you have this and it goes uh, virally around the globe and everyone understands uh, what is the context. Again, we see there are many different contexts to those, uh, but we understand the core message of it. Something is, you know, absent, something is missing, you know. So on the one hand, we have this communication about grievances and remembrance and injustice, solidarity, accountability, uh, but also action. And we have two different kinds of uh, political actions. One is uh, backward looking. So again, something that happened like, uh, all kinds of violence. So when we see actually a victim shoe, we understand that we are talking about some loss, absence, and some kind of violence. And it can be road violence, violence against women, terrorist attacks, uh, mass atrocities, uh, cartel wars, or governmental uh, violence. But there are also those actions that are forward looking, especially if we talk about climate change. This will happen in future, if we don't do, you know, so there are all kinds of things that we can actually place or uh, uh, desires that we place uh, upon those uh, objects actually to share this notion of uh, desired uh, future. But on the other hand, uh, we see that also it has a very limited impact uh, on the real, you know, day-to-day -day politics. Although it has impact because, again, it is read as the will of people. So it is actually in a, in a core something that is very democratic, uh, how those uh, uh, desire objects are being used. But it also produces not, no new forms of social inequality. I'm sorry to say that because once you put uh, and you make some kind of action, solidarity with Ukrainians, you are actually excluding all other uh, you know, migrants, and they're not only that they're being again marginalized, but they're, you know, they're just buried away somewhere deep, deep, uh, you know, they're not getting actually any visibility uh, and solidarity. Uh, and also solidarity does not equal human rights, that is also important. Those, uh, uh, and this is my final slide, so those final uh, slides, uh, I feel like uh, I owe you an explanation. 
I still didn't write this chapter, so it is a bit raw, and <laughs> things might change, my conclusions also might change. But at the end of the day, the afterlife of the dead, desired objects uh, and desired futures. So desired objects link the memory of the past atrocities with the current events, and we see that there is a huge array of uh, those uh, events. Desired objects provide a globally recognizable vocabulary uh, <clears throat> that, sorry, that may shape our political action, and desired objects carry the warning, this is also important, but also the hope of the desired future we wish to have. And at the end of the day, you know, those who died and those shoes leave them, uh, um, gave them another life. So maybe those people are not with us, but those shoes are carrying all kinds of messages. So at the end of the day, I think this is a, a, a hopeful story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lea, for this really provoking uh, presentation. And also thank you for sharing uh, um, uh, your your new hypothesis with us. Uh, first of all, I, I had a lot of questions, but I, I just want to start with another provoking question. Do you know other objects or artifacts uh, which can work such, such, a per, such a, uh, the same perfect way as uh, these shoes no. can work? I, okay, okay. I'll, I am <laughs> like literally breaking my head and asking people to think through if there are other objects. And uh, I'll tell you why. There, uh, what is interesting that uh, there are other images that are uh, also very strong that we carry through this process of uh, circulation of, of uh, knowledge. Like we have also piles of glasses. Uh, we have uh, piles of uh, teeth and hair. First of all, everything that has to do with bodily parts cannot work because uh, people generally tend to feel um, disgusted by it uh, or so shocked it is something that emotionally cannot be uh, processed in a way that can be transformed, uh, transformed into a action. Uh, it is actually the other way around. It is something like you just want to, to, to shut it away and to look the other way. It is not something that is... Uh, especially the, everything that has to do with I, I mean, the explanation is much longer, but it has to do with the, uh, the way in which we perceive our uh, body. It has to do often with religious uh, perceptions uh, of the body, but everything that has to do with actually um, bodily parts cannot work. So what can work? So uh, we see, for example, there, there are three um, additional uh, object that I, ca I can see how they can work in sit different situations. One is a key. Key is very rec recognizable in many different contexts, for example, um, but it is also very much embedded in a particular narrative. For example, this is a symbol for, uh, uh, for the Palestinians and for, for their uh, struggle. Key is uh, you know, a symbol of uh, their homes and expulsion, but it is very, very narrow. Again, key uh, is always something that we have, it has to do with the home. And so it means, okay, either you left your home, you had to, you know, it has to do something with the moving, but it doesn't necessarily say uh, uh, that. So it is limited, it has its potential, but it is, uh, again, limited. Second object that is very interesting uh, is a uh, suitcase. Suitcase, again, you see that food, food, uh, the photo of a suitcase, you will immediately recognize it as, as uh, relevant. But suitcase uh, is problematic for two reasons. First, uh, in many of those cases, a suitcase uh, is not something that you find in a mass grave. It is not even likely that you find it in a, you know, places of torture. So it is not exactly goes into this definition. Again, that's like methodology here, not, not maybe a, a real reason. But the problem with the suitcase, it also narrows it down because it is, has to do with this function of traveling, moving places, uh, you know, leaving something behind. Again, it is very limiting in that, in that function. 
And probably the most um, clear symbol is the yellow badge, yellow star badge. But it is so narrow that you cannot apply it to different uh, mass uh, atrocities because it is so specific that actually, and on the other hand, we, we saw that uh, during uh, Corona, yes, they, 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 they used, they it, used uh, it as without a, any hesitation. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that, that, is, uh, that is correct. But um, uh, in this kind of political elections, people will not use it lightly because it has so many connotations, specific connotations, and it draws attention to the Jewish suffering, and often it has to do with something different. But as I said, still didn't write that chapter, so things might change. <laughs> we have a couple of questions, but uh, I cannot read it. <laughs> I will ask uh, Teresa to help me because my eyes are not so good. It's very happy, thank you. Um, Thank you. So, so it's about. Um, can you hear me? Um, it's about when the actual shoes appeared in Budapest. How many of them? For how long? What was the reaction to them? That that was uh, just recently, maybe three weeks ago. Uh, they appeared. Uh, again, this was after, ah, it was uh, just after the um, Bucha uh, massacres, so they, uh, it was a s relatively spontaneous action, but actually we saw that after uh, in many other places, as I said, Georgia, and the shoes are still there, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is also, again, um, protest against uh, this war, but it is also support and solidarity. And uh, so it is about awareness, but it is also about uh, uh, injustice that is happening somewhere else. Uh, the same person just wanted to see the last slide again. I don't know if you can provide it again. Well, I don't know how to turn it on. But the last slide uh, says thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe the one before that. Uh, 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 Lea, I would like to... <laughs> wow. Uh, I just want to go back to the shoes. Because um, there are two other questions with which I cannot answer. Uh, the memorial in Budapest is itself um, uh, the memorial of, of, of shoes. Mm -hmm. And it became the, the memory space of uh, other political activities or, or, or memory activities from, from, from bottom up. So it is not a uh, uh, memory politics of, of a government or a political party, but uh, uh, different uh, local uh, subcultures just started to use uh, this given, by the way, very decent memorial with this uh, 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 goose eyes, I don't know in English, so uh, the, the iron shoes. Uh, and uh, I followed the, the story of the memorial and uh, I, 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 I liked it because it was a, a very cheap memorial and it was planned to, to stay there and then struggling with the weather, struggling with anything else because it should stay there because it can open the place for, 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 for remembering on the very specific uh, episodes, uh, a very specific episode of the Hungarian Holocaust, uh, the mass uh, mass massacres on the on the river of the of the Danube, and I wonder because it's maybe the shoes. So I wonder why this small, absolutely not attractive monument can open the the social space for other activities, other commemorations, other political agendas, etc. So I, I'm also critical, but on the other hand, I think it, it is really interesting how these multi-layers of, 
of memory and memorials can, can um, build a kind of dialogue uh, uh, between uh, different uh, uh, memories. I, and I completely agree with you. I think that uh, you're right, it is about uh, those layers, but it is also about communication and about our understanding how those symbols, what they mean. So you have those, and by the way, I think it's a, an excellent uh, uh, memorial space because it is a, exactly what you said. It is there and it is, uh, a, and you don't know when you approach it, is it like for real or is it because of the weather there? Yeah. And there is something so precise, I think, about this one. Uh, but just to be sure, this is not the only one. There are many, many memorials that have shoes you know, I, I didn't go into those details, but uh, there are so many, so many um, exhibitions that are just about sh of victim shoes. But and they are these, real shoes, and they, these are not real shoes. No, there are many. Are no, 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 no. There are many, there are many uh, exhibitions that are art objects. Uh -huh. So you see all those, how this uh, circulation works, because it is layers, mm -hmm. because it is, because you understand that this is a real object, and then you understand that this is not a real object, but it, it communicates with this. And then you have th those new shoes there, which is, again, new form of communication. And you understand all those layers. Mm -hmm. Even without, you don't need, you know, you don't need to, to have knowledge about it. You simply understand it. So it is, I think, fabulous, especially when you start to see different contexts mm -hmm. in which it, it works. And, and people understand, again, this core uh, issue of, you know, absence, you know, like uh, we all have here shoes, you know, and but there are people in those shoes and yeah. suddenly you have, yeah, so, the the, is the, so the, what is, so the whole contrast and how it works, I mean, I think it is brilliant because it, it opens up so many new mm -hmm. questions, actually, mm -hmm. how we can understand those different mm -hmm. places and even places of memory without shoes, how shoes become, you know, mm -hmm. suddenly... I mean, I, we can go to, uh, and again, the whole history of, uh, you know, the um, Ameri uh, American uh, Holocaust Museum actually uh, landed to yeah. the... Sorry, okay. <laughs> I had yes, that for, for yes, me. It was yes. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Peter and then uh, Miriam. Thank you. Um, can first you just of, while you yeah, ask, uh, take yeah, it because it is probably better, of course. Well, first of all, thank you for this very rich and thought-provoking presentation. I'm kind of still wrestling <laughs> in my thoughts somewhere in my head, but but I I just have two kind of very specific questions. One one actually continues the issue of the shoes. Um, I really like your sort of compelling narrative of the continuity of this sort of original or primordial Holocaust memory centering around the shoes and. It's very long, long and, and spectacular story of, of the various usage or use of, of, of different type of shoes. But, but I wonder also if, if it is not, not to a certain extent also misleading, because I, I sense a, um, an important shift or a change between these two type of, of, of remembering or, or ways of ways of memorization. I mean, first of all, I think that 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 one of the most important, so I mean, the most important power of. Uh, of the shoes, um, the ability to to, to represent um, very powerfully the, the memory of the Holocaust actually comes from from the fact that 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 they are objects, uh, they are found objects. So so they were there, so they were not 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 made, not fabricated. They were just found as as they were there. So I mean, um, oh, um, um, and, and I think it is it is it is very important because. Because in that sense, they they suggest that that they were that they were not subjected to manipulation. They they have they have a certain idea of, of a direct reference to, to reality or some some historical reality. While in, in many of these these sort of memorialism projects or protest um, projects, the, these these shoes are, are clearly not found. They, they they were brought there. They were sort of consciously prepared to represent something. Um, and I and I wonder if 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 you. I mean, have, an, have already have an idea uh, of of what what the org organizers might uh, might have uh, in mind, so what 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 might have their intentions when mm -hmm. uh, when they were trying to set up. So I mean, if if you 
perhaps found any sort of, of manifestos or programs or, or demonstration speeches, whatever. So I mean, that's, that's my first question. The second one is, I think it's, it's probably easier. <laughs> why, why do you call these desire objects? I mean, I, I think I, I in, in a way, I, well, I, I, I have a sense of, of, of what, 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 you, what you mean about, but, but, I, but I, probably I just do not catch your, your, your specific intention, and, and I would appreciate if you could explain this a bit. Okay, uh, so first question, it is, uh, there is a diff, you raised uh, at least three different questions in my opinion. Mm -hmm. One is the difference between memory versus knowledge. So memory is something obviously that has to do with remembrance, but knowledge is something that we know without any intention, you know, we know about Holocaust shoes because it was, you know, we read about it, we see it, it's, it is a bit like an image of 9-11. You see that, I mean, you know what is it about. You, it is just your common knowledge because it is being uh, all over the place. At the same time, your knowledge about shoes is there because, uh, you know, you watch movies, you see uh, popular culture, you, I mean, it is just something that we have. So, first of all, something that is uh, contrasting, it is very important uh, as a notion, as a process that is happening once we see uh, those authentic shoes. And so now we are going back to the second question, so to say this uh, authenticity versus manipulation, so to say. First of all, I mean, the, uh, the uh, I'll not go into it, but the whole debate about it, uh, authenticity is uh, very uh, prominent in um, uh, literature, you know, the importance of it. And that's why also th those uh, desire objects, they're authentic, they were there. I mean, I claim they don't, as we often uh, say, uh, they uh, uh, tell a story. They don't tell a story. We tell a story only if we actually ascribe them agency. So I'm trying to understand what what is needed uh, for an object uh, from this authentic state of, you know, you have something that is found there, through those uh, uh, reincarnations uh, to get to actually, uh, for that object as a category to get uh, uh, agency. But also those authentic objects are always manipulated in a sense that you see them in a museum uh, you know, preserved, uh, they're un untouched, uh, they, you, you want to keep uh, those uh, muddy stains, you want to keep uh, blood uh, on uh, t-shirts, I don't know. So this is also sort of manipulation. You, you didn't put them just to uh, decompose. Uh, you put them under lighting, you put... So it is authentic, but it is meant to provoke certain emotion. Now to your uh, third part of it, in terms of uh, those who are making those protests, I don't know, it is maybe uh, good to take a look at it, but uh, it is very clear to me that they choose that because it is very easy to communicate message through it. Very easy, you know. And it is also very easy to say, oh, can you each one of you bring uh, a pair of shoes, uh, you know, for this? We all have spare shoes. It, it is not, uh, and the more, the merrier, you know, and, the, and the, as you have diverse shoes, even better because you have... And the message is very clear because it so corresponds uh, with those victim shoes. You understand this? Um, and desire objects, again, I know it is counterintuitive, but it is actually to say what is the potential of those objects, emotional potential and value of those objects, because we all have, you know, in different cycles, uh, different desires, you know, that we project upon those objects. So I thought it would be interesting that something is so dark, actually, to give to, to, to name it differently, just for us to start thinking, actually, what are those desires that we place into um, those objects. Thank you, Miriam. Actually, Peter has, I think, also put my question <laughs> with the first question, so thank you, that was answered. I just wanted maybe to make a comment because for me, when I think of shoes, I always relate, of course, to the picture from Auschwitz or the, um, uh, the installation. And that is why I, I, uh, I was rather like uh, thinking like Peter put it, you know, because for me, this is a narrative which we evoke all the time over and over again. 
but I'm not so much convinced by the shoe theory in a sense of could it not be anything that is just, you know, giving something personality and is replicated many, many times. And for example, I was thinking just recently in Viv, there were people putting this protest with the Kinderwagens mm -hmm. in the square, the people from Ukraine, like they fled from their hometown and they put uh, in order to signal what the war has kind of disrupted within, with families. They put empty kinderwagens on the street, like on a what huge square. Kinderwagen, kinder trolley, uh, trolley, uh, stroller. Uh, ah, ha, ha, yeah. ha, ha, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. And I think it was a very, very strong message because everyone, you know, could relate to childhood, to a baby, what it means in a family and so. So I found it very interesting. And for me, this would equalize, yeah? Just we don't have this narrative or because you mentioned also Srebrenica. When you said Srebrenica, I was thinking of these white crosses, you know, this... I don't know, thousands, hundreds of crosses. And that is for me equally a, a picture. So I wonder, you know, how do you relate desire objects to something which doesn't have to be a personal object, but is something just an object, but signifies, you know, death or torture or, yeah, war. Just to clarify, Srebrenica is not crosses, it's the other way around. Well, it's I, like a yeah. Muslim. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you're correct that there is um, this jump from a singular ob object to a quantity. So it is, you have one shoes, a shoe, you have then pile of shoes. You have one stroller, then you have, and it has a different message. It has a much stronger message. Uh, I think you know, you're, ex I, I remember that. I uh, think your example is really good. I, I, I need to think through this, uh, uh, but I think that even that actually uh, talks to those other shoes in a sense that the message is the same message, just now the focus is more on the kids because again about innocence and so when you want to go to, into something more specific, you, can, you might use something different. But again, this I think would not be... Uh, will not have this uh, 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 power if we didn't have all this, all those cycles before that, uh, this circulation of knowledge and what does it mean? Uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, uh, but again, we, I need to think about it. Uh, thank you for that. Um, because other objects I couldn't find that, yeah. So. First of all, I want to give the ah. uh, possibility to this Zoom colleagues because they are really segregated. So I, I will ask <laughs> Teresa yeah, yeah. to integrate them into the discussion. So there are a few more. Um, Sandra says, many thanks for this very interesting talk. Would you see letters as objects that follow the same circuits as you described? And what about the extra dimension provided by their content? What is the first part? Um, so it's about letters. Would you see letters, letters as objects that follow the same letters. circuits? Letters, letters could mm -hmm. be shoes. Uh, letters and photos are in a different category, in my uh, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, they they need completely different uh, uh, engagement from a people once you displace them from from their private spaces to museums. People need to be much more engaged to read, you know, and also it is very flat. So you will have, you can read one letter, you will not read many letters. It is also, it has to do something with our uh, span of attention, you know. So it is, uh, although they can emotionally be very uh, charging, but I think as a impact for a, for a collective audience, uh, their impact is uh, much uh, smaller. Also, they're flat. You know, there there is something about uh, object that has uh, three dimensions. Uh, photos, on the other hand, uh, again, they're very important. But photos, if you can combine photos and those objects, it is always much better. If you can have, you know, a pr this uh, old watch that was found in a mass grave, but you can have a photo in which this same person was carrying that watch. You can. This works uh, excellent as a contrast. So there are all kinds of situations under which you can actually uh, make the impact of, of those objects much, much stronger um, in museums or places like that. And then there's one more question. 
Um, when are you expecting this research to be published? <laughs> including the final chapter. <laughs> when, when do I expect to finish it first? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> um, oh my God. And I, I, hopefully I will finish it uh, in the next several months. But, you know, the um, god of uh, publishers uh, can be very cruel. So, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. But fortunately, we have two more questions also in the audience. Or three, I don't know. I just have a short comment, really. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I think I have an idea in favor of the shoe theory. Could it be that shoes are so powerful because you do not need a narrative to understand them? Because you do not need a narrative to understand them. So even if shoes are found, um, you know, along the line of the idea that don't actually know if that saying exists in English, but clothing makes people. So you see a shoe and you have an idea of who the person was that, that wore the kind of shoe. So you do not actually need a biography or a narrative behind the shoe to get an idea of the person that the shoe belonged to. I don't buy that. No? I'll okay. tell you why. I mean, ju ju just to be sure, I've been obsessing about shoes in the past three months, so it was not easy to live with me. And uh, I would say yes, but then uh, you see so many shoes thrown away and you will not pay attention to it. And not that you will not pay attention, you know, you will not know anything uh, about the uh, shoes are, you can see them also in many different con uh, contexts uh, and uh, without, you know, person inside. And you will not know much whose sh shoes are those or it will not do anything to you. So I don't think that you can understand from shoes themselves anything if you don't have, uh, you know, if you don't have context, uh, meaning that if you see a shoe, uh, if you remember, my first uh, slide was a uh, shoe and uh, you see one hand, uh, which is obviously mass grave. But that is a context. You don't need to know if it's here, where, where is it taken. By the way, it's in Ukraine. But you don't need to know that because you understand. Uh, but if you have a shoe, just a shoe, it will, you will not know anything. You know, without any context, it will, it will give me example. How can you understand something about... Uh, or why would it, it in any way be interesting for you to, why it will draw your attention even? That is the thing. It will not, it will not make you, you know, react to it. I think it would make me react emotionally if I have an idea of who this person would have been. Because mm -hmm. I see a stylish shoe and I feel like that's a stylish person or that used to be a stylish person. Or I see a sport shoe and I think, oh, that person... Sporty. But where do you but, <laughs> well, you but know, no, give me where do you find where do you find those shoes? This is the context. How how you see those shoes? Where is it like you see them on a photo on a street? What where, where do you see those shoes? I don't I don't say that you cannot have much information. Uh, let's say you are passing the street and you you know there are shoes on the on a tree like they're often uh, like. Uh, so you you will know something about anything? No, you will not know. I mean, and it will. What context do you have about it? But we are discussing only the only shoes which were presented or exhibit, exhibited or used by a performance. And then I think this is the clue. So if you 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 you, pro I agree. you produce the beautiful no, yes, a I beautiful agree. staging. So what is happening with an object? Uh, so I sorry I didn't uh, I completely agree. Uh, but that is a context. No, I was thinking like uh, you know you're walking and you see shoes. So just no. random shoes. It, it will not say anything. So no, random shoes can be yeah, random anything else. No, apple yeah, no, no. Or okay, so banana. I think, uh, yes, yes. I think yeah, <laughs> you're you're. But again, it goes to this category of shoes. This is. So different because why don't you have uh, clothes? Because you know they're falling apart. Uh, they are not. Uh, th th it, there is something about so shoes that, that is more sustainable. In a sense, by the way, it takes forty years to uh, decompose shoes. No, in the shoes. So I think she. I, I, I agree. In in a shoe, there is the trace of a purse. Yes. And I think this yes. is the imagination of the shoe, and this is yes. how a shoe can make, make a kind of aura in a, in a special social act. So I, 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 as I understand you correctly. Yeah. 
No, no, completely true, completely true. I mean, there is a, it is interesting to see, for example, gender and victim shoes, you know, like uh, status and victim shoes. What can you read? You can read on, you know, uh, uh, age. So you, the, you know, I s s narrow it down to victim shoes, but actually victim shoes is a huge category of many different things that, or many different details that you can actually understand about. Uh, and each one of us will actually uh, perceive different things because we have different experiences and we are drawn to different things. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is so rich, so rich, much more than if you have a pile of uh, uh, watches because that is also a commodity. You can live without a watch, you know, so it is, but shoes is, it is, it is annoying how not important it is when you have it, but it is so important when you, you know. You are part of a society. Without a shoe, it's not easy to be part of the society in the 20th or 21st century. But Ola wanted to say something. And uh, Emily. Uh, yes, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And uh, I wanted to a bit dwell on this uh, connection between desire and object. And I wanted to ask you what, uh, if, you, uh, if you focus in your research also on like, bad desires and ugly feelings that objects can have. And I'm thinking, of course, in the, um, in the framework of genocide about these objects that were taken uh, as trophies uh, by perpetrators or stolen by uh, neighbors and uh, kept for long uh, in their houses and um, sometimes they still are there. And they don't have this uh, fantastic trajectory that you uh, described. Uh, and I wonder if this is some, something also of your research, uh, from your research that you take, uh, you also describe these different stories that are not so pretty and they don't have this powerful political message that is like, based on empathy and solidarity. Because I'm thinking that some objects might end desires, but desires might also project completely different political uh, future that is based on completely different uh, like uh, emotions, and um, they are not so positive. Okay, so you said I think thank you for this because you, again I think you asked me two different things. Uh, yes, I take into account uh, many different uh, biographies and trajectories of all those objects because I'm trying to show that actually such a small number of those objects goes through this, what I uh, suggested. Many of those other things happen to them or they stay in uh, private homes or they get destroyed or they get uh, stolen or, you know, they, they just decompose or there are many, many, many things along the way. Each time it can, many other things, you know, some of as I said, stay is in a museum storage. They never qualify to be good enough in a good, they're not in a, they don't have this, you know, the authenticity that, or they have authenticity, but that it's not, you know, exactly what we want there to clean or to whatever. So there are many stories like that. And yes, I take this. Uh, and the other uh, thing uh, is you're so right. You're so right. I mean, I try to, because my uh, first book is uh, very pessimistic and I, <laughs> I, I show actually how this uh, human rights memorization agenda doesn't work. So I wanted to now give it a bit more uh, <laughs> optimistic because I didn't want to be perceived as a person who is very pessimistic, but I didn't get to it now. Uh, what I want to do in uh, this next chapter is actually to show uh, how some of those objects are used uh, for the sake of human rights and how some of those objects are used for the sake of uh, nationalism, uh, all those uh, things that are like uh, just actually promoting uh, very uh, sectarian uh, uh, things against someone else. So exactly those uh, um, negative things that you can, you can read out uh, from those. Uh, not that, not done yet. So yes, that is the next uh, step. <laughs> Emily? I think you just answered maybe, or provided an answer for what kind of what I'm interested in. Um, like in a sense, seeing all of the images of all of the actions connected with shoes actually kind of made me angry because it's over and over and over again. And to what extent, like, 
is this getting to the next, it, it's like, I'm convinced there that the shoe has become a sort of global language or metonym or something for taking action. Um, has it produced action and in what ways might more, um, I guess more specifically uh, framed um, actions? I. I think, and, and maybe I, I'm misremembering this, but I, I thought I had read something about like a um, an action involving like people putting out coffee in the former, uh, I think it was maybe in Boston. Ah, uh, cup, cup, uh, yes. cup. So yeah, this, this and, an and this, project, yeah. you know, the sort of absence of this time together mm -hmm. with the spouse. And it's like, is is something like that that's, that's much more specific to the cultural context more effective than sort of utilizing the sort of global language, a, a global... But effective uh, for whom? What do you mean by effective? Or, uh, is, effective is, in producing... Is, what a, is, but what is yeah. your uh, end game Ooh. here? So, so that but, is the question. Yeah. So, so it, it yeah. can be effective for something that is very, very narrow. I mean, this project with the... Uh, uh, sorry, I... I started to. With those yeah, uh, no. uh, coffee cups, it, uh, it is great, and this is this uh, uh, again eight thousand of those cups that are uh, representing uh, all the friendship and you know the families that are not there and everything you know because there is this costume going uh, for a first morning coffee with your neighbors. It is very locally embedded and it is excellent it is also moving uh, uh, from one place to another so it is excellent but the question is is it effective for what it is effective for commemorating srebrenica yes that is true but he, uh, that is very narrow in that sense so it is very i will not get into it it, it has also a very ugly political side to it but uh, <clears throat> Uh, the thing about uh, the shoes, two things I wanted to say. I said at some point, something that you started saying, like, okay, I get it. Everything is about shoes. Is it, is it a trend? Is it going to, uh, are we going to be at some point, oh no, shoes again? Like that this symbol will become so uh, tired in a way. I don't know to tell you, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, I need to think more about it and to maybe to try to see how, what is happening. Uh, but the last thing I want to do with those, and that this also goes uh, for uh, uh, what you asked, uh, I want to map moral claims that go with each of those. Uh, pro uh, so once I have uh, uh, those moral claims, claims, I will see like what is again uh, the aim here? What they want to achieve? Is it for some, you know, the, there is much more to be done here because only then we can understand what political action, you know, is it effective? Uh, again, it is going to be very uh, difficult to connect it to a specific political action to say because they put their shoes there and they claimed X and Y and Z, the government did, you know, we cannot do that. But still, uh, mapping those claims will, will give us completely new spectrum of, of how people react to those symbols, what are those, and what political action is possible out of it. So it's much more, I, that needs to be done. I, <laughs> and, and I think I got, yeah, I think the sort of, sorry, I always think of myself as having a very loud voice, but I, <laughs> and that was, I, I guess, yeah, like if you have seen that, it, that the, uh, not utility, that's, the, is it becoming a, a tired symbol in terms of, you know, is there a debate about, okay, should we use shoes or something else? No, but, no, I don't think so. But yeah. just when you're stuck for three months with shoes, uh, you think it, you, you think people will be tired with that. But actually, maybe it's only me. So I don't know to, to, to tell you. But I don't see signs. Uh, on the contrary, I, I think it is just going to grow in a way of a like a kind of a social movement of like a uh, shoe language. <laughs> Sounds like a cartoon. You mentioned that you want to write a more uh, optimistic mm -hmm. book. I, I'm not sure that it will be the, the, the result of this. Uh, thinking about uh, uh, the meaning uh, of, of these shoes and also in a very symbolic and politically uh, very... Um, um, focused way, 
but I want to thank you. Uh, the lecture, it was really, really inspiring uh, in, 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 multi, in so multi-layered mode because uh, um, we, we haven't touched the fundamental question of this whole story. So why it is important for us? So why we want to have these shoes? Because we want to have it uh, la <laughs> as you see, uh, the whole world needs to touch these emotions. And I think this is actually in the shoe. It can be in many other objects, but I think it is part of mourning. It part, it's, it's part of social uh, integration. And as you mentioned, as, as, you, as, as you stressed, it is also part of restructuring, disciplining, and uh, uh, yeah, powering the social, the social uh, 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 yeah, universe. So there is a hot, really hot issue, a very important question, why we need uh, these objects for living or being social. So thank you so much. It's, it's really great, and we will think about it, and we will discuss it uh, later with you, if you want. I hope you will never think about the shoes uh, no. the same way after today. Thank no. you so much. Yeah. It was lovely for you. Thank you. Thank you.